well, I think we'll make a start because I feel like there's a lot to get through. And um, I just want to give us the most, the, the greatest opportunity to have the most discussion. Um, so welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we'll be discussing the dream team. Um, and I must admit, I got the idea from um, the, the, N the NIH uh, in the US as they had a similar webinar that discussed uh, the dream team and implement, or I guess they called it something different. I labeled it the dream team of implementation science. Um, and I think it's such a relevant conversation because as we try to, um, you know, align implementation science within our research, we often find ourselves wondering, well, who's going to do this part of the work? Who's going to be the implementation scientist? So who do we need on our team in terms of getting this intervention into practice? So we're really going to focus today from our four experts that have joined us. Um, uh, and our panelists focus on how do we build that capacity for implementation science for research projects. So before we officially start, um, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. Uh, for me, that is the Gadigal people of the EUR nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So I'm Carolyn, I'm the, uh, the chair for the INSPIRE team, uh, and with me from the INSPIRE group, we have Mona uh, who, and Liz, who will be facilitating the discussion a bit later. And then also a quick thank you to Bonnie and the, uh, to, and to Bonnie and the POCOG team for helping to put this uh, webinar together. So without further ado, I'll start introducing our panelists, of which we have four amazing researchers, implementation uh, researchers. And so how it will work is I will introduce each one. Uh, they'll give a little bit of a, of a spiel about what their research is about. Um, and then we'll get into the discussion uh, just afterwards. So I'd first like to introduce uh, uh, Associate Professor Stephanie Best. Uh, Steph is a senior research lead for the Implementation Science Group at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center. Um, and she has traditionally been involved in genomics-based research, but is an implementation science guru. Uh, Steph, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, give a little spiel about uh, your work? Um, I'm, I'm rather terrified to, to step into an implementation science guru um, <laughs> role, so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just put that to one side. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm now based at Peter Mac and VCCC. I, I started my career um, as a clinician, as a, a chartered physiotherapist back in the UK many, many, many years ago. So I've held quite a few um, clinical and leadership roles sort of internationally and um, in the NHS. But I got quite interested in why it was so hard to change practice. We, we kind of knew the evidence, but that wasn't enough. And, and, and I'm not talking about just other people. I, I, you know, I was talking about I observed it in my own clinical practice as well. So um, fast forward. Um, a few years and, you know, through a master's and PhD and, and now um, here in Australia, which was never part of the plan. And, and yes, Carolyn, so I've spent the last five years working with Australian genomics, looking at implementation in that genomic space. And, and recently I've moved down the road to um, Peter Macken and VCCC and so starting off some projects um, uh, here as well now. So I've got a whole range of projects um, going on, yeah, largely based sort of in genomics. That sort of seems to be sort of where my um, my interests that lie at the moment. So um, I'm, I'm wrapping up a project around reproductive genetic carrier screening, um, which is a national program looking at the um, healthcare practitioners who are the people who are involved in offering reproductive genetic carrier screening and putting interventions in place to see if we could facilitate the offering of reproductive genetic carrier screening. Um, I'm also in the middle of a project that's looking at automating reanalysis of genomic data. So at the moment, you will go and have a genomic test, um, and we get that data, and that's great, and then it will just sit there. But the beauty of doing a genomic test is that you can go back in and you can reanalyze it, but we don't have a process in place for that. Um, so that's a really, really exciting project, so collecting some data around that at the moment. Um, and a whole load of sort of other projects, but one I thought might be worthwhile mentioning one is around that digital health space is really, really growing, isn't it? And so I've got a project that we've just kicked off that's a, um, a joint project with Peter Mack and um, Swinburne University. And we're looking at developing a sort of bi-directional communication platform is the terminology I've been given rather than an app. Um, there's going to be between the genetic services at the, v, um, not the VCCC, at um, the SCC and their patients. So they can communicate in between appointments um, and improve that. 
Um, but obviously, I've just said I'm, I'm quite new at Peter Mac and BCCC. So the first um, real, real sort of piece of work that I'm doing across the organisation is a priority setting exercise. So really identifying what are the thorny implementation issues that people who are in the organisations at the moment, what is it that they're struggling with? Um, and we're going to do a sort of two stage, a kind of a staggered Delphi type study with a series of interviews. And then we're going to follow that up with um, some, some ranking work to identify well, which of the priorities that we as a team should be looking at across Peter Mac and BCCC. I could go on, but I better stop there. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks so much, Stefan. It's so good to hear that uh, you're working in the digital health space now. I think we'll take a lot from you, I'm sure, especially with implementation. I actually just went to, I came back from um, a conference overseas where I met some Swinburne University collaborators who also work in the digital health space. So you're probably working with them. We'll touch base about it. Um, but thanks so much for your, uh, for your intro and for giving us that info. Um, I'll move on now to in introduce Associate Professor Natalie Taylor. So Nat is a health psychologist and implementation scientist. Uh, she is a Scientia Associate Professor in Implementation Science and Health Systems and the Director of Research um, at the School of uh, Population Health at the University of New South Wales. Nat, do you want to give us uh, a little intro about your work? Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the invite, Caroline and, and Mona. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, yeah, so, so as Caroline said, I, I'm Natalie, um, I'm based at UNSW, um, and I've probably been involved in implementation science uh, for about, I don't know, 13, 14 years now. Um, I, I, I used a behaviour change framework um, as part of my PhD to um, help to promote physical activity um, amongst university staff and students. And just by chance, the, a job opportunity came up where they wanted to use behaviour change frameworks to implement patient safety guidelines within the NHS. Um, so I took that framework um, as sort of a starting point um, and developed an approach um, to understand what kinds of um, behaviours were involved in, in implementing these guidelines to help uh, make care safer for patients. Um, and what kinds of um, psychosocial and, and system related barriers were um, affecting, you know, kind of people doing these particular uh, target behaviours um, and, and then kind of designed, you know, co-designed a, a whole host of implementation strategies um, to try and um, support um, people who were, you know, kind of doing these different kinds of patient safety practices like um, inserting nasogastric tubes or, um, uh, you know, reducing midazolam injection, um, which is a, an anesthetic drug. Um, and so this, this kind of experience just, it just kind of introduced me to a whole new world of um, what behavior change uh, means, what it can do, um, and how meaningful, um, you know, the, this kind of work can be. So from that point, I was always really interested in staying involved in the clinical space um, and uh, you know during my my time in Australia um, a large part of the work that I've done has has involved um, working with um, genetics and genomics um, similar to Steph um, in particular a project um, we've just recently completed and, and doing the kind of final data analysis around um, understanding and improving the referral pathways for um, cancer patients uh, with a high risk of a uh, genetic condition called Lynch syndrome um, to try and understand um, how we can make sure that patients aren't falling through the cracks. And one of the things that we did there um, was we um, worked, we, we kind of, we understood from our past experience that um, a lot of the things that we were trying to do as a research team um, with the clinical system um, was really quite hard, especially when you're working with different hospitals time and time again. They've obviously got a lot of different contexts and setups. Um, and we wondered whether it would be worth trying to see whether we could um, capacity build skills with people from within the health system um, to apply some rigorous implementation methods um, in, in practice. Um, and sort of take their colleagues um, on a journey with them um, to, you know, to kind of go from 
um, whatever the particular problem was. In this case, it was um, patient referral, which involved a lot of different uh, roles and elements of the health system um, to make sure that that was done appropriately. Um, and, um, and I guess to, to really try and see whether or not we could start to spread these skills within the system. Um, so that, that's, I guess, kind of like a little bit of a, a passion pit of mine, um, you know, is really trying to understand how best to, um, you know, have us as the researchers um, and, and give other people, um, you know, who've got a better chance of spreading these great skills um, across the system. Um, and, and I guess as part of that work, what one of the things that it's really uh, taught me about is um, the value of um, the, the kind of clin clinical experience in, in the system um, to do with these different kinds of practices. Um, so one of the thing I'm really interested in is, is um, this kind of space around clinician intuition and, and how much, you know, to what extent does do the ideas that they come up with for um, changing uh, practice or implementing something new, um, to what extent does that align with what the theory would recommend um, if we understand what those barriers um, actually are? Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of a space that I'm involved in. Um, and, and then I would say that the, the other thing that I'm really interested in is, is thinking about the cost of implementation. A lot of the time, um, you know, statistical models can tell us how well an in intervention can perform. But a lot of the time it doesn't take into account the effort that it takes to get it into practice. So that's um, another area that I'm, I'm really kind of trying to explore. Um, you know, is there a way to really carefully look at the cost of implementation and the cost of different implementation approaches to see what's the most cost effective way of getting um, uh, evidence into practice? Um, and I guess the, the Kind of final project, um, I kind of talked a bit about Lynch syndrome, but one uh, we'll be, we're embarking on quite soon is, um, is an NMRFF um, rapid applied research translation project um, to look at integrating precision medicine into routine healthcare. And so this is opening a lot of um, new areas for me in terms of um, ethics, um, uh, you know, this kind of research versus uh, practice um, chasm um, and also um, looking at you know that how we can use um, artificial intelligence to keep understanding how we can improve um, practice based on the results that we get from uh, different trials um, so that's just a bit of a snapshot of the, the projects I'm involved in and the things that I'm interested in um, and I'll, I'll shut up now and pass to somebody else <laughs> thanks Carolyn no worries. Thank you, Nat, for that so much. So much to unpack there, I think, in the discussion. So many good um, points that you touched upon that I definitely think uh, we're going to touch upon when we move to the panel discussion. So thank you. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, our next panelist, uh, and I'll stop sharing because she has a couple of slides, uh, which is Dr. Heather Shepard. Uh, she's a senior lecturer at the Susan Wackel School of Nursing uh, based at the University of Sydney and the program manager for the ADAPT program which uh, as we might know, uh, near and dear to us here in Pocock uh, is one of the, really the, I think it's like the pioneer implementation trial um, for psycho-oncology. So over to you, Heather, please. Thanks very much. So I'll just, um, let's go. Hopefully you can see that. Sorry, I did a nice little pretty slide for you. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to give a bit of background of me. So welcome. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to be part of this today. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so my name's Heather Shepard and I'm just, uh, first of all, I'll just acknowledge I'm speaking to you today from the land of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So this, I guess this is just a bit of a flavour of where I've come from. So implementation science or implementation has been something I've always been passionate about. I was a, a nurse um, in intensive care many moons ago. And uh, I guess when I was thinking about this session today, I was thinking about all the different teams that I've worked with that have shaped who I am and what makes me think about implementation today. So you can see on the right, all the different teams that I've come from. There's a bit of a UK flavor I noticed from the panel today. Um, <laughs> um, and then um, obviously the clinical areas that I've worked in and then the roles that I've had since. So it just really made me think about this is what shaped me and why I guess implementation science has really fitted with me. And whilst um, I guess uh, 
working on the ADAPT program as part of POCOG um, has been, uh, you know, actually something that, you know, a real focus for the last sort of five, six years. It's the, it's the program that keeps on giving um, for those of us who are part of it know. Um, there's so many publications that are coming out of it, and that was a real focus on how do we actually implement a clinical pathway into practice with those research questions being really key. But all of the stuff of my interests around shared decision making, health communication, health literacy, first actually burdened, uh, I guess, emerged from I was actually a linguist. Uh, that's what I did at Newcastle University. And when I first went into nursing, seeing um, bad news being broken badly just really highlighted to me the way communication is so important and can make such a difference. And so when I moved over to Australia and fell into this world of research um, back in 2003, um, I've always been focused on actually how to improve communication in practice, which led me into health literacy, shared decision making and all of those things. And so every piece of work and piece of research I've been involved in since then has been about thinking about that applied nature how do you actually make the experience better for patients better for their carers and better for the health professionals as a health professional who no longer works in practice I'm very keen to keep those that are in practice there because I feel guilty at not being there myself um so that's kind of what drives me and I guess um obviously I mean we've uh I've as uh, uh, Carolyn's mentioned, obviously been involved in that clinical pathway work and there's um, work that I'm involved in in um, other clinical pathways as well. But also, as you can see on the list, online education, patient experience, um, uh, any any context of health really interests me. I'm not wedded to a particular context because I'm really about the context of the experience of health and well-being for patients and staff. So all of those things are of interest to me. Um, more recently now, I'm a research and teaching academic in the um, Sydney uh, Nursing School of um, so the Sydney School of Nursing and Midwifery. Um, so put my nursing hat back on, although I've never actually worn a hat because I'm far too young. Um, um, and then actually, particularly more recently, I've now taken on a role with the Sydney Health Park partners um, uh, implementation science um, practice as one of their new leadership team which um, was announced a couple of weeks ago and I'll be doing that a couple of days a week within my role um, as at the university as well and I guess in doing that I don't want to talk too much about all the different projects that I've work I'm working in I'm sure that will come out in the panel but I guess the other thing that I got, thought was really important was in thinking about team was thinking about which team so this is just a slide that highlights in the ADAPT program, and there's, uh, I, I think Joe Shaw is on, and Mona, who well know the ADAPT as well. Like we had the big massive research team of investigators. There were 22 investigators as part of the research team. But then when it actually came to implementing the clinical pathway in practice or the intervention, it's the team based at the service. So I think it's really important for us to think when we're thinking about teams, which team are we thinking about? And who are we thinking about here? So you may have a research team, which has all the expertise you want in developing things, but you also may Maybe need to think about the team that are going to help things to actually happen in practice and so on the right you can see in our work we had you know 12 teams in the 12 different services and they were made up of many different people and it was really key to get those right people around the table um, and included you know nursing psychosocial admin it medical trials allied health and i just thought that was a good illustration for us to think about when you're thinking about your research you're thinking about your research team but also the team that's going to help the thing to happen in practice and having that spec. So that's all I guess I wanted to say, but looking forward to the chat. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Heather, uh, for sharing that and for giving us that context as well, because I think that's very important to distinguish. And maybe that's something that we'll, we definitely will chat about um, in the in the panel is, you know, what your focus is, I guess, when you're implement is it about the research? I think Nat touched upon this as well, you know, the intersection of research and practice, and who is going actually to be leading the, uh, the intervention to be uh, put into practice. So it's definitely a question that I think is uh, probably a bit of a uh, a fiery one that uh, we all want to know the answer, but it's probably more complex than a straight answer. Uh, but before we move on to the panel, I'll introduce our last panelist, uh, which is Dr. B. Brown. Uh, she is an implementation and health services researcher. Uh, she's also the program manager for the Enrich program, uh, which is at the NHMRC Clinical Trial Center at the University of Sydney. B, would you like to go ahead and uh, give us some info about uh, projects and things that you're working on now sure. and actually I do have one slide which is kind of a bit of an outline of um, enrich which is probably sure. easier to flick up rather than try and explain it because it's um, not gonna go well let me just share my screen um, but before I do that so basically I started um, working in health services research at the Sachs Institute back with many people that are also on this call um, in 2008 and then we established the implementation research group there in around 2010 
Um, and shortly after, we were awarded an NHMRC partnership grant, which was a um, step wedge cluster randomized implementation trial, which was done in collaboration with the Agency for Clinical Innovation and the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. So um, actually reflecting on what Heather and Nat have both said, um, it was actually called clinician-led improvement in cancer care. And it was very much all of those interventions were kind of bottom-up approach to where's the issue from the needs and barriers analysis, like how do people within the system see that we can actually change these practices and implement things that will be sustainable. So I think absolutely agree with everything that, um, that Nat and um, Heather have said. Um, and then in 2016, after finishing my PhD on said study, which was a bit of an unwieldy beast, uh, moved to Sydney Catalyst and took over, well, actually we established Enrich programs. So I've been there right since the very beginning. Um, Another unwieldy beast, actually. Um, so Enrich is a prospective clinical cohort study um, of patients with lung cancer, and it was established as a sort of translational cancer research program. So um, we cover everything from the T1 basic bench molecular science right the way through to T2, T3. So um, right down at the bottom here where I've got this um, red circle is where my research interests really lie. Um, so we actually collect a huge clinical audit data set on our patients. We've got over 2,100 2, and something patients in that data set now with about 7,000 data points. It's just absolutely enormous. Um, and then we get patient reported outcomes as well. So basically what we've done with all of our data um, is established a whole suite of evidence-based quality indicators um, that were developed um, through a kind of modified Delphi process. So we whittled them down from about 30 odd quality indicators to eight that our clinicians tell us they believe are the most important, but we can talk about that later. Um, and so we've now identified where we've got um, variation in, in clinical practice across our six clinical sites, which actually cover um, six local health districts, but about eight MDTs, nine MDTs. Um, and so we're now at the point where we're looking at what interventions we can actually implement to address this variation that we're seeing. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I'm up to at the moment. I think agreeing with what um, Nat has said, I think I'm really interested in how people within the system see that you can actually resolve these issues that are there. Because I think if you kind of enforce things from the top down, you just get people's backs up and you're just, it's a losing battle. Like you just, you, you know, you're not gonna be set up for success. So I think, you know, that's that's where my interest really lies. How can people within the system actually um, solve the problems that we tell them they've got? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Pete, for that insight as well and for sharing your program with us. Um, it looks amazing, honestly. Uh, I can't wait to get into the, the conversation. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over um, the facilitation of the panel discussion to our other two Inspire members, Dr. Mona Ferris and Miss Elizabeth Beasley, and they'll go ahead and kick us off. So they'll ask some questions. We have some pre-prepared questions about how to capacity build. Um, but of course, if any of our audience members have follow-up questions or would like to ask anything uh, in the chat, we'll be monitoring that as well and giving it to um, our panelists. So, uh, Mona, can I hand over to you? All right, thank you everyone for the introductions. I'm very keen to get into the discussion um, as well. Um, so, I'm actually going to hand over to, to Liz to ask the first question to um, Steph. Um, and of course, if any of the other panelists have any comments um, that they would like to add in, please feel free to do that as well. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Liz. Um, so Steph, I was wondering at what point um, do you start thinking about or putting together the research team? Um, well, I start thinking about um, uh, the team. I, I, you're kind of thinking about it all the time. You're definitely thinking about it before you get any funding and before you have any project that you're kicking off because we're always looking to grow skills and capacity in implementation science and really just picking up sort of on, on the points that have been raised earlier we're often working with um, clinicians lab scientists policy makers um, consumers um, as well as um, researchers with it with a capital r and so we want to be building sort of understanding around implementation science amongst all of those people um, sort of as, as we go along so that that time when we get a bid um, sort of you know sort of approved and we're, we're about to sort of get underway with a project <clears throat> we're, hopefully we've already started sort of setting the scene at that point um, if, if we're thinking about the nitty-gritty of, of sort of bums on seats and, and, and that kind of side of things we probably have to think about that at various different points 
along the journey. So we need to think about it before a project, and then as we're writing a project um, and getting it submitted, and then it may get up, it may not get up, and um, then say it gets up, and then we might just think about it at that point. So I think that there's no one, for me anyway, there's no one specific point where I will start thinking, hmm, what would be a good team here? And I think it's something that, you know, sort of you're working with people, you're, you're developing your networks, you find out where areas that people are interested in. Um, so sort of ongoing would be my, my, my shorter one word answer. Hmm. Well, thank you. Do any of the panelists have any anything they want to add to that? When do you start thinking about, you know, putting together your research team? I only to say I agree with Stephanie <laughs> is that, you know, it's an ongoing process. And sometimes as you're thinking about what you first might think you might do, and then sometimes as you move through that process in developing a project, you're, you may go off on tangents or you may think, actually, maybe we need to do this. So sometimes your team member needs will change, even as you're writing a grant, because you suddenly think, actually, we need a bit more focus on this. This is probably more important than we thought. So mm -hmm. it's a real kind of uh, ongoing process. Um, so you may start off with, okay, we definitely need a person from this and a person from this and a person from this, but it can be very evolving. Mm -hmm. And obviously the life of thinking about an idea to getting funding of an idea, <laughs> many times though that team membership can change because people knew, I was just talking with a colleague of mine um, outside of the research world who works in government and she's uh, uh, always confused by how long the lag is between us coming up with an idea and it actually getting funded and how that can possibly work for partners. Anyway, so she's still in shock about that something recently um but i guess the other thing i would say i guess an important thing about a team is being working with people that you know you can work with and that you can work mm. well it's just a massive bit of advice is um work well with find a team and team members that you can work with and you can each bring out each other's strengths and all complement each other yeah it definitely makes the process a lot easier especially if you're working together for several years so definitely something yeah. important to keep in mind I, I always think that that's, I've, I've, oh, sorry, Matt, sorry. Sorry, just, Steph, you go, you go. <laughs> I, was say, no, I, was just saying, I always think that I've hit sort of, you know, it, it, it's if I, I, if I manage to work with people that I want to work with on an area that I'm interested in, then happy days, you know, it's yeah. kind of like too good. Too good. Absolutely. Um, I, I was going to add a couple of things. Um, the first one is, um, so I, I haven't worked with everybody um, on the um, panel today, but I have worked with, Steph uh, quite a lot and also um, with Carolyn who's one of the facilitators so they would be my top two to be honest um, in terms of you know have it, having them on a team um, it, you know it's uh, as Steph was saying and, and, and also Heather you know just people that you enjoy working with and and I think that you know get it um, you know there's I think there's 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 something about implementation science um, that um, it's quite special really, um, you know, kind of as an area, there's, there's so much to it. Um, you know, if you, you know, you really want to apply, um, you know, kind of the practical skills, but you want to really understand how things are working in a whole ball of complexity. Um, and I think um, when you see people that have a passion for that, um, then it's really, I think that's, you know, a really amazing sign um, that, you know, they would be a great person to work with. The other, the other thing that I was going to say, it kind of taking it off on a bit of a tangent, um, is, is really um, thinking about if, if, you know, if you're kind of working with others who have a, an intervention or a piece of research that they are developing and tr trying to think about, you know, when, when's the ideal time to help them to think about when they need an implementation uh, team or, or some implementation expertise along the trajectory of, of the development of their particular um, intervention or innovation. Because um, what we really want to be able to do is, is not get an intervention to a point where it's developed without having done some background work as early as is, is possible and, and that funding will allow to really help you to understand, is this going to fit well um in in the health system or or in the in the set in the health setting that you're kind of aiming uh, for it to be in um, so i think you know as much as um we don't want to waste funding on on interventions or innovations that um aren't going to work we 
we want to try and find that kind of sweet spot where um, we can we understand that it's got real promise um, and we can get in there early to try and help you know give it the best chance possible um, once it's ready um, and to make sure the health system is ready for it as well. Mm. So, so I guess being quite strategic and you know planning ahead of time to make sure that it's successful in the end that's definitely something yeah. important to keep in mind. Um, and I guess just another question for, uh, for Steph and for the panel as well. Do you think there is an optimal um, team size or would that depend on other factors like, you know, the funding or the size of the project or, you know, what's your experience? Yeah, I, I, my one word answer would be no. I don't think that, I mean, I mean, there's no one size that's going to fit sort of every project. It, it needs to be different for each piece of work that we're we're getting involved in. And I think thinking about this sort of quite widely, I think for a successful implementation project, we need a really wide suite of skills of people to be engaged. And, and we've talked a lot about those sort of already sort of who who we who we need to have on board. But it, but it's also sort of you know sort of the data experts or the health economists and and sort of a, a sort of wider suite of uh, people that we will want to kind of Get on board, nice. Um, and sometimes we're not necessarily just looking at a sort of small implementation team. We're looking at quite distributed teams that we're working across. And so some of those will be in the clinical setting, or maybe consumers that we're working with, and some might be other researchers that we're working with. And I sometimes kind of think that we 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 need to be thinking about thinking who do we want not only in our team but who do we want in our tribe, and 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 thinking sort of far wider. And I think this sort of reflects sort of. Some of the things that Nat and Heather have sort of already talked about and the fact that um, the complexity of what it is that we want to be, be addressing, but also that we want to be working with the end users of whatever the, the work is that we're, we're involved in. We want to be working very closely with them. Um, so I think that starts to sort of spread things out further and further rather than sort of coming in and imposing, do you know what you should be doing? This is what you should be doing. Because we all know that that's never going to work. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it's definitely honing in on um, different people's skill sets. Absolutely. And sometimes those skill sets are sort of, you know, uh, we can uh, we can label them, um, you know, sort of with a with a research label. And sometimes it's about their contextual experiential expertise. Um, and so I think that that's why implementation side, I think it is special. I think it's a really good way of saying, of course, it's special. because We're all here and we're special, aren't we? Um, but, but it is it's it's. Um, yeah, complexity. I can't think of a better word than that this morning. I obviously need my coffee. Um, but it's, it's thinking about all of those different people who are going to be involved. Um, and it, 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 these things are never simple. It's never just sort of one, two, is it? It's always one, two, oh, and then there's three, four, which really, you know, so we would need to be thinking sort of quite broadly. Mona, I was just going to add, I mean, from the ADAPT programs experience, as you saw, like I showed up, we had, there were 22 investigators on the original grant and stuff. And obviously that's a big team as well. And then with the RCT, which was one of the last parts of the whole five year program of work, there were teams at the sites. But in order to I guess to manage all the different components of the whole program over the five years, we actually created kind of working groups to, um, you know, kind of create little sort of groups focused on particular parts of the large program of work and and I think you know a, a group of 22 all trying to decide something is quite unwieldy um you know, which is a word I think it was B that used that about me. <laughs> um so I mean certainly I think kind of smaller groups and you know there's no perfect number but I think you know six to eight is so you know a good kind of size group to kind of manage different perspectives as long as you've got the right people and the right perspectives in the room um so sometimes even if you've got a large group contributing to the whole program of work you might be able to have smaller groups um, to move you through certain things because I think 22 people around a table is I don't know it's quite challenging to actually agree unless you've got a very strong chair <laughs> that kind of thing um, but I guess that's the only thing is like you may have a large program of work but you might be able to do little subgroups or working groups off that um, but that's still the team is still a big team even if you um, come compartmentalize but not compartmentalize makes sound separate but you know what I mean <laughs> yeah yeah Just, I would yeah. agree with that because that's definitely what we've done more recently with Enrich and obviously because it spans kind of you know a lot of different specialties then you actually ensure that the decisions are being made by the people with the expertise in that particular area rather than people 
who, you know, they have a very strong opinion potentially, but they're not necessarily the right person to be making <laughs> the most advised decision. So yeah, I think kind of, yeah, the, the working group thing is a good idea because if you have too big a group, no one will ever agree on everything. Yeah. And I think so definitely, all, yeah. Sorry, but I was going to say, I think it all depends on what it is that you're trying to do, doesn't it? And so we've got to think about what is it I'm trying to achieve by getting this group of people together and identifying who the right people are and, and how many of those people might be might come at that particular point yeah and Nat I'm wondering if you have any perspectives on um, that as well um I, th I think um I think everybody's covered it to be honest um and I think um Steph you know touched upon people are often dispersed um and they're all in different environments um so they'll all have different perspectives to bring um so however far, you know, if it is a trial um, that's, you know, underway, however far that reaches, I think you need to make sure that you've got touch points um, in all the represented contexts um, to, to make sure um, that whatever it is that you're attempting to design um, is going to be, you know, appropriate for those contexts or at least uh, flexible enough to be able to adapt to them. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask that, how would you define expertise? Expertise, ooh, so um, I think initially, I sort of touched upon before around differentiating between implementation research and implementation practice. And, and I think, you know, you can have expertise in one or the other or both. Um, and usually um, I would say you can develop you can develop expertise in one area and, and if you if you develop an interest in say for example you've got implementation practice expertise then you might start to develop an interest in implementation research or vice versa um, so I think you know those applied implementation skills um, versus the applied research skills in implementation is, is important to distinguish and with that I think um, with anybody who's interested in implementation research it's probably important to have some exposure to the clinical environment um, you know whether it's talking to clinicians observing practice looking at data to see you know what processes look like um, from a you know from a data perspective um, in terms of that patient journey or uh, the practice that goes along with that um, in order to really help people to understand the context within which they're trying to make a difference, um, it, it, even if that is through implementation research. So I think um, gaining that uh, practice, practice ex experience, um, or at least an understanding of the context um, is a really good thing to do. Um, I would also say, you know, in the end, most implementation projects typically involve trying to get people to do something new or something different, but in a complex environment. So having an understanding um, or some experience of behaviour change, health systems and complexity are probably three key areas that I would recommend, um, as well as, you know, an understanding of how to work with stakeholders um, who can be very um, challenging uh, at times, uh, depending on um, how busy they are, what their priorities are, um, you know, and, um, you know, what stakes are I guess for them as well um, and um, and I think if you you know as you are recruiting your your team trying to understand what people's strengths are I think Heather mentioned that earlier on um, what people's you know kind of areas of interest are you know in our team we have um, you know researchers who are really interested in um, the, the kind of the data side of things and really understanding what practice looks like and figuring out how to link data up and um, how to map that to the, the process as it looks on on paper and then we've got others that are really interested in things like implementation mapping um, to try and you know really understand um, those barriers and uh, facilitators to change and what strategies can be helped to optimize um, implementation um, so I think, you know, depending on what people are interested in and, and what the skills are and where they want to go, how far they want to take this, um, it probably all kind of um, comes into expertise <laughs> in some way. 
Great. Mona, did you, thank you. Yeah, I guess I, I'm just quite interested as well, like with, um, I guess, more junior staff um, or, you know, people who have just finished their PhD and who want to get into implementation science research, I guess, how do, how do they fit into larger implementation projects? Because, you know, if we're talking about expertise, you know, junior staff are often those who are, you know, still building skills. And so I guess what kind of support could they get, um, you know, when they're joining these types of projects or... I guess, what kind of roles could they get into? I wonder if anyone can comment on that. Um, I'd probably say some of the some of the things that we've tried to do, um, obviously there's always an ethics amendment on the horizon. So, you know, enabling, um, you know, more junior researchers to be added to ethics, to be able to access data and work with it in different ways is, is something that I really try to, facilitate and encourage within my own team um, and and I think you know I kind of mentioned it before just you know figuring out what people are interested in and, and what their strengths are um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a another another um, another kind of element and and helping to expose those people to as many of those areas of interest um, as you can so whether that's you know different networks um, you know, um, helping, you know, helping them to be um, a, a, a more junior member of staff on a grant uh, submission, uh, to, you know, to help bolster. Um, I think, you know, conducting systematic reviews in the implementation science space is a really good way for people to get into the literature, really start to understand the nitty gritty of things. Um, and that kind of thing can then transfer into applying um, some of those skills, theories, processes, um, you know, outcome measures, whatever it is that um, they've been focusing on. So I think um, that's that's always a really good exercise as well. So yeah, I'd say probably, you know, reviewing different kinds of literature and, and then being able to work on uh, projects through ethics um, would be two of the key recommendations for me. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, and B, I wonder if you can comment on that. I guess, you know, starting out in implementation research, what helped you? Um, I think I was just thrown in at the deep end, actually, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, yeah, I think there was a bit of a shift in the, the team that I was working in and um, CIA left the SACs and went elsewhere and basically went, can you deal with this and why don't you do your PhD on it? So I just, I did. I mean, I think in terms of... Um, junior researchers, I think, yeah, kind of the practical exposure on the ground is really valuable. And I think it's something that I've noticed, like it can be quite intimidating. And I think you have to acknowledge that you've got to grow quite a thick skin. It's very difficult when you're dealing particularly with clinicians who are very senior. It's generally the more senior clinicians who are the most set in their ways and the most resistant to any type of change. So I think it's just building that skill set and kind of just having people see how more senior members of the team actually deal with those types of situations as well, so that they're actually observing that how to actually navigate those potentially quite difficult conversations is, is quite valuable too. Mm, yeah, so I guess it, there seems to be two different ways to get introduced to implementation <laughs> science research. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing I was just going to add, obviously, I've just come back from this week and uh, last week and the week before teaching on the implementation science masterclass. But I think there's nowadays, obviously, I think and no, I appreciate B was thrown in the deep end, but I think there's a lot more opportunities out there now to learn a bit more about the theory of implementation science. Now, there's definitely it's a, a burgeoning, growing uh, space with lots of frameworks and models and uh, and different uh, ways of thinking about it that are still growing. So it's, uh, um, I think there's opportunities and those masterclasses were aimed at people with, you know, projects who are thinking about how to apply implementation science or bring implementation science into their projects. And many people that come along to that um, maybe were part of a bigger program and were PhD students or early career. And I just, I mean, when I was talking with the people on the, the 
the the master classes like you know you're now going to be the experts you may be one of the most junior members of the team but you're now going to be the expert in implementation science theories in understanding that difference between the intervention and the implementation and getting your head around that and now having access to what's the best way to report these things carefully and clearly so that we can continue to build and learn from each other so I think maybe looking for opportunities to um uh, build on what Natalie was saying, like looking at systematic reviews and there's, you know, or completing those things, definitely ethics and writing ethics applications and being involved in that and ask, you know, being able to lead some of that maybe to grow you how you work about that. But look for the opportunities for learning because there's a number of courses around Australia now um, that can help you to learn about that. And I would look for those opportunities because it is a growing thing and a lot, sometimes people don't really, aren't really clear still what it is. And so for those of you who are young in your research careers and not necessarily necessarily an age but you know because we're all come to it particularly clinical people come into research later we're not normally 21 coming into this um there's opportunity to really get some of that um theoretical background so you can really understand and be able then um to build your confidence in uh you know demonstrating what you know to some of the senior people that may not be familiar with the way these things are being designed and reported now to um expand the growth of the science yeah, I would agree with that. And actually, I mean, I did say I was thrown at the deep end to be, to be fair. The SACS was running lots of masterclasses. I think Brian Mittman, who is the founding um, editor of um, Implementation Science, came out. And actually, we have quite strong links with Brian. So very early on, I did an exchange over to the US and went to RAND, UCLA, the Veterans Affairs with their implementation research group. So actually, like there was that founding in like the research skills and the theory as well as being thrown in, in the actual practical side of things. <laughs> but I think, you know, and, and you mentioned courses in Australia, but there are lots of online courses that you can do through like NIH and various other organizations in the US as well that you can register and attend online. So there's, there is a lot of opportunity for training out there as well. It's always good to know. Yeah. Steph, did you have any comments on yeah, that? Yeah, I just want to say, I think, I think everything, totally agree with everything that the chats just said already, but also sort of if we're talking about expertise and implementation, then we also uh, uh, need to acknowledge that it's not just our implementation expertise that comes into play, it's all that other expertise. So we've all, all of us have talked about the fact that um, we need to be working closely with the context that we're going to be uh, doing the implementation work. So actually, that's a massive source of expertise that, that, that comes into play there. And so some of that's clinicians, some of it's consumers. And so um, I often talk about implementation research as being a team sport, and you need to identify who it is you need on your team, and you need that contextual expertise as well as the implementation expertise. So I think that um, particularly um, the voice of consumers is something that we need to ensure that we recognize as being expertise. Um, because a lot of the, the in, um, interventions that we might want to put in place, they may well end up being the end users. So actually, if something isn't a problem for, for them, and we're looking at putting an intervention in place, then it's kind of like, actually, we're sort of wasting, it might be a nice academic exercise for us, but really, we're wasting their time and sort of everybody else's time. So so that I just, just a shout out, really, just to really be acknowledging um, that broader expertise that goes beyond our um, implementation research expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, for this next question, I'm going to throw it over to Nat first. Um, so when you're working on large implementation science projects, how do you allocate um, different roles within the projects based on things like, you know, expertise of, as we've just spoken about or about seniority or skills? So how do you allocate those tasks within a project? Um, I think kind of touched upon before, you know, understanding what people's strengths are um, and their areas of interest um, and also where they're based, um, you know, so if there's people based in different, you know, kind of different settings, um, then I think, um, you know, it would make sense for them to be able to do um, interviews, for example, with the stakeholders um, that are within their setting. Um, but it may be that, um, you know, somebody who um, I think, you know, has a lot of experience in, in intervention mapping or implementation mapping could be the person that leads uh, the design of interview schedules, um, you know, just to make sure that they're, you know, grounded in whatever framework it is that we're working with at the time. Um, and then I'd probably say another another thing is, um, 
you know, process mapping to me is something that has become increasingly important in a lot of the work that we do to try and understand, um, you know, the, the the patient journey, the practices involved in that, um, and that you know how much how much um, people see a particular process versus what the audit data can tell you when it's mapped against it. Um, that kind of thing can not only help to understand where patients might be falling through the cracks uh, from a data perspective, but also where there might be differences in um, what people think um, is being done um, versus what's actually being done. Um, and, and collecting data and designing those maps, um, you know, having the skills to um, often uh, analyze interview data um, from uh, you know, a, a number of stakeholders often in the same room or on the same call, um, you know, to kind of pull all of that information out to understand what that process looks like and to consult people afterwards um, to, you know, to keep refining those maps um, to me is a super skill um, that I would recommend um, you know, that pe people have. And what we've been trying to do in our team, I guess with all of these different areas really is, is expose in some way. So you might not have experience or expertise in it, but we'll help you to gain some. So even if that's just through observations initially, then you might conduct an interview, then you might help to design the schedule, then you might help to, you know, neaten up a process map before you actually pull you know something together through analyzing the data so you know that would just be an example of I think it's just um you know slow practical introductions that I would be trying to give my team members um to make sure that they've got the exposure that they need and they're just slowly building up the skills um yes I think deep end sometimes is necessary um you know sometimes time can't wait for for anybody and you know we we do have to kind of say right okay um it's time to do an interview I know you've not you know had much time to practice but um you know there's if somebody somebody said they're free and available and you're the only person you know here that, that can do the job so I think um you know having you know giving people those opportunities to um, test themselves and challenge themselves um, and realizing that they can do it um, you know it's um, I think that's an important thing you know in any job really um, as well. So it sounds a little bit like you know capacity building in a sense. Yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah I wonder if um, Heather maybe you can comment on that I guess with the ADAPT project having you know such a large uh, research team how are different tasks or roles allocated within the team? Yeah, I mean, I guess when I, uh, we, obviously we got previewed some of these questions, I kind of, I was half thinking, okay, there's one aspect you can read this as how do you allocate, you know, tasks within a project based on seniority or expertise, you know, obviously sometimes when it comes to applying for grants, there can be some kind of ordering of what appears to, you know, seniority, and that can be based on, you know, the best chance of winning the funding. Sometimes, if we're honest, in this world that we live in, which is very competitive, and as much as I hate that part of it, it's the reality. And I've certainly had experience of myself of being trying to be CIA um, early in my postdoc career. And even though I had very senior people, the CIB or CRC, where I weren't, we weren't considered, it wasn't considered sufficient, which is very frustrating. Um, but I think that, you know, you have to kind of, I guess, think about you have your team and maybe you have the team that's ordered for the grant proposal but then when it actually comes to the body of the work maybe the seniority and expertise can kind of shift a little bit because different people can have different roles within that so I guess it's within you know as we you know as you know within the adapt working groups you know different people were pulled into teams and it wasn't necessarily the 22 investigators because we also had the staff that were employed on the grant as was myself I wasn't a named investigator on the project originally um, I came in because obviously I knew the POCOG team from previous work that I'd done and Mona was part of the team but we've had about you know 12 staff go through <laughs> over the five years um, different aspects of work and and I think that you know it's kind of as you go through that then different people you know obviously people's you know their capacity and their expertise grows with the life of the project as well and so I guess it's like you know Alloc roles can be allocated and people can grow into what their strengths are. People may have strengths in the qualitative stuff. People may have strengths in understanding the context. People may have strengths in being the linchpin or the facilitator in the clinical context. There's certainly somewhere I think where 
I think I've brought strength to a lot of the projects I've worked at because as a nurse, I've always been very comfortable with talking to the most senior consultant and talking to the cleaner. And it's just as an ICU, as what I did in the NHS, that's what you do. And nobody phases me. Everyone's just equal. I, I give everyone equal respect and, you know, for all you, because it's all such a key part. But if you've never stepped into a, um, a clinical area, never picked up a into medical notes and felt comfortable opening them to look for what you need to it's quite daunting and I sincerely remember that in the old Sydney Cancer Centre and being very comfortable but having colleagues that were not comfortable doing that because they'd never done that before and so I think you have to kind of work out who can do what and what the expertise is and then I think you know over the life of a program or a project um, people's um, leadership in certain areas can shift and change with the project and as um, different aspects of the project are written up so seniority can sometimes be in that grant phase but you know that may come first but that doesn't mean to say in my view that it can't shift as you come down to you know reporting on the project and presenting and concentrating on different aspects that have come out as part of the work that's kind of my answer to it I don't know whether that makes sense to people but yeah. that would be but it, it's always an ongoing conversation that I think you need to have within your team around that aspects and around who's taking the lead for these things and who's being supported and I think it's that succession planning and looking to support people by the people is really important so I would always try to team up junior people with more senior people in that way to give them that support I think yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think the other thing as well is that if you are the more junior person in the team, don't be afraid to actually step up and say that you want to do other things and actually to put your hand up and volunteer and say, I would like to, you know, be involved in other aspects as well. Because if you don't say anything, you know, you may get overlooked. So I think, you know, you need to you need to drive that yourself to a certain extent as well. And just to take it sort of slightly laterally, I think that's a really good point that, that, that Heather just brought up about, you know, sort of that people grow in these roles. It's really, really important that people record all of these opportunities that they have and the activities that they've done, because sometimes, you know, somebody will say to you, you know, can you go and do those interviews or this, that and the other, and you kind of, oh, OK, uh, or, you know, whatever it might, or you might develop something. And, but, and you kind of think, well, I'm never going to forget that. But actually, you then come to write your CV because there's a new opportunity come up or there's a grant or that, you know, you always have to write your CV in, in academia, don't you? But and then you kind of go, oh, what have I done over this? I haven't really done anything over the last year. But actually, you have because you've led a series of interviews, you um, designed interview schedules, you, you know. And, and so it's really, really important that people keep a, a live CV where they just keep making a note of all of these different opportunities and activities that they've had even if it's very messy and they don't quite know how it's actually going to sort of come together that's fine just on a day-to-day -day basis just throw it into your live cv and then you can come back to it and reshape your cv for whatever opportunities come up that's such a great uh, yeah. such a great tip <laughs> yeah because the beauty of implementation and this work is the transferable skills that we all have from all of those things that's such a great tip <laughs> mm. And um, Heather, just kind of continuing on with, with that kind of question is, how do you identify the types of skills you need for an implementation science project? Because I know Steph had mentioned earlier that, you know, you generally um, recruit people who have a range of different skills and, you know, also taking into account the, the end users or the consumers. So how do you determine what kind of skills you need to make the project a successful one? Yeah, I guess in thinking about this and obviously building on from what other members of the panel have said earlier, I think that, of course, this depends on what and where your research is set and what your research, what your intervention is, if it is an intervention or what your, you know, your question is or what you're um, trying to do. But I think in, I guess, in my view, I think it's really keen, it's really necessary to make sure that you seek engagement and kind of equal representation from all users of the initiative or the program or the intervention or the practice that you're trying to uh, change. And I think that, um, I guess I'm thinking here for now working with the service and, and you obviously more and more, I think we, I mean, that's one of the interests, I guess, of mine is that thinking more about really, you know, good co-design, co-production with our end users from the very beginning, um, even of developing up an intervention, thinking, having those in mind at the beginning and making sure that we're doing that better from the start. Um, but I think also um, thinking about the work that we did with ADAPT and other things that you wanna make sure that it's not just the staff that will use the pathway or the guideline, it's actually all the staff that will come into our 
come in, come I guess interact with that pathway or that project or that guideline as it's put out in practice. So you know it's the you know the clinical staff, the nurses, the doctors, the psychologists, the social workers potentially, or and physios, but also it may be the administrative staff, the computer support officers, the IT systems that you might need. And look, they're the people I think that sometimes we overlook and can be overlooked. And it's certainly something that I've always been, Joe, and that will be you know I'm always passionate about that. You know, reception staff, admin staff, let them know what's going on, involve them in part of that stuff because as um natalie has said around kind of the mapping and the workflow stuff having being having a really good understanding of how the current workflow works and then and who all those key players are that understand that because what you may hear from high level around how things work in practice and what actually happens in practice <laughs> Uh, is can be very different and if you don't have those people around the table um as part of you that's um that's you know you're a big miss because things can fall over we know in adapt we've talked about it's the little micro logistics you know like how do we you know in some services where although they have emr they still use paper notes and how do you how do you how do you get the slip you know into how do you note the doctor <laughs> to mention this thing you know and it was all about so who's going to actually put these stickers put these leaflets that we've decided to use on those files and it's, so you've got to know who those people are and get them around the table to make those happen so I think it's really that's a really massive and, and key part of implementation is really understanding how work currently flows and how you need it how you might need it to adapt that flow in order for your intervention or initiative to be successful and often it's not necessarily changing it completely it may be actually adapting things slightly that they already do so I guess that's for me that's kind of how you need to think about who you need in, as part of your team so all of those things are absolutely important and if it's a whole of service and most of these things are in the whole of service and that's one of the big challenges is sometimes is getting all those people together because they don't meet naturally they don't generally have a meeting where they all come together we have clinical teams often have meetings around, you know, um, clinical status of patients and, and things, but not necessarily service their whole service. Um, so that's one of the challenges. But I think it's a really important thing to think about who are all the actual users of this initiative or this program from the very beginning. And, you know, how do patients actually come into the service and how do patients go out of the service? Because they don't all come neatly in one way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would also add to that, um, Heather, I think that's a really great point. Um, and it kind of speaks to, um, you know, that kind of you're trying to you're trying to design, you know, this rigorous implementation trial and um, test different approaches, for example. But if you don't understand all of the different people that are involved in a particular process, um, then you don't know the extent to which the, you know your intervention or implementation strategies have been um, adhered to, um, and mm -hmm. and often when people learn of particular problems, especially when data tells them that they're there, um, they can often want to run off and and fix it for themselves. And I think um, you know having mechanisms in place to investigate those things um, you know having the skills to be able to understand what a process evaluation big or small you know can look like um, alongside um, these you know trials of different implementation approaches is mm -hmm. is a really um, a key skill to to have and one of the things that I've been sort of trying to um, I guess workshop within my team is is you know, introducing, you know, can a PhD student do a process evaluation alongside a trial? And um, that's a way to help them be exposed to all the different elements of an implementation science project and um, look at it from a real kind of um, big picture lens, um, but also get down to the nitty gritty um, of, you know, understanding what strategies have worked. Um, you know, under what circumstances for who and why and even at what cost. So I think, um, you know, a process evaluation, um, you know, it, it's, I guess there's a lot of skills involved in that, but it would be one thing I would recommend. And it kind of tying into that, um, it's also, um, I think it's, it's becoming a bit more, um, uh, I guess, popular is maybe not the right word, but um, 
something that I'm certainly using more and more um, is, a, is a notion of a logic model. Um, so really understanding what, what is your intervention aiming to do um, and what are the factors that will affect its implementation um, and, and kind of, you know, what are the steps that we're then going to take to address those particular factors. Um, and so I think really kind of laying that out in logic model format, not only um, can it be helpful for you to get your head around what it is that you're doing, because there's so many different components and moving parts, um, it's really easy to get confused. Um, but I think having something on a page for your stakeholders, which you can strip back and, and add to as needed, um, is, is something that, um, you know, is, is a really kind of useful thing to have. Um, and I think the final thing it sort of speaks again to that whole thing around, you know, often people who aren't on the research team um, can run, up, run away with, um, you know, trying to um, implement their own solutions, um, rightly or wrongly, they might be the, it might be the best solution and, and hence why a process evaluation can be really important. Um, but just having that kind of, um, you know, that level of comfort and calmness that it's going to go off <laughs> in about a million different directions um, and you know just kind of you know feeling that that's okay um, and not freaking out about it um, I think is probably something I've you know definitely learned along the way and um, you can't control that much stuff um, so you, you've just got to kind of um, even if you, if you can't control it then can you monitor it um, that would be my, you know, my other kind of skill <laughs> to um, to advise on. Um, I would agree with that. It's funny, actually, we originally had somebody in our team who had come from a clinical trials background and she just, she just couldn't handle it. She just freaked out. <laughs> I just, I can't, it's just, there's too much adaptation. There's, you know, it's just, there's not, yeah, it was, it was not the right environment for her. But I agree with what you said, Nat, about your, your program logic, because I think it not only guides your sort of needs and barriers analysis and your implementation, but also your evaluation as well. So you know exactly like the whole yeah. flow from beginning to end, like, you know, this, it gives you a much more well, logical approach because that's the whole point of it. But yeah, I would agree with that. We used um, workflows and I acknowledge our colleague, Lindy Masio, who was part of our team then, um, and who created these amazing kind of, you know, workflows for each service and, and then what each role person who was in the project would have, or, you know, at, based on the services. And they were really involved valuable for the whole lead team at each service to actually see how it all came together but also in doing that could identify actually we need to we need this person we don't know this person actually we need to bring this person in because they'll be able to answer that question where why isn't it getting from here to here so it's actually really useful to have those things and I think it's just I think as we mentioned earlier you know um Sometimes it's only in going into that in detail with the people that you find out you need even more people, <laughs> different people. But that, that's really important because when it comes to actually starting something, if you haven't got all those ducks lined up in as good a row as you can, or the three different rows that are going to lead you to the, the holy grail of it working effectively, um, obviously with a few adaptations and a few ducklings being born along the way and going <laughs> off in different directions, um, you know, it won't work. But it's it's very much a you know um, a ongoing process, and I. I certainly recall having to be or, or being a little bit assertive in some of those meetings going you know maybe we do need these people around the table can we get someone you know being a bit pushy sometimes um with people to say no no we are definitely do need these people here we definitely need you know representative with people there and so sometimes you need to you know be a little bit you know <laughs> make sure you get all the people that you think that you need around the table um and sometimes it can take two or three goes to get the right team together <laughs> And I, I, I think I think some of this speaks to some of the things we've talked about sort of earlier about you know who do you need on your team and 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 I was talking about the fact that actually we need to be thinking about it way before we've got an actual project in place. It's a lot to do with how we're communicating with people and how we're sharing ideas with people. And and there is this um, as a clinician speaking with my clinician hat on, very very solution focused. You want the best for your patients. You do not want to be hanging around while somebody goes off and gets ethics. Thank you very much. And finds the right theoretical framework, and then they put it in place, and then they no. You want a solution that's going to work for your patients 
who's in front of you now this minute and that tends to be the way you work sort of in you know with your clinician hat on and then as a researcher you'll go well that's all very good and I can understand that and that's excellent but at the same time that's only going to benefit that one patient mm. and so what we want to do as researchers is we want to be benefiting that one patient but we want to be benefiting the you know sort of all the rest of the patients that are going to be coming through your door and so it's I don't think we can suddenly have these conversations with people I think it's about um different groups being able to understand the different perspectives as they come together and just that iterative conversation about what it is that we want to achieve and why it is we need to go through these processes and yes I know a lot of ethics processes are an absolute nightmare but we can get through it and 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 really just um those ongoing conversations really Heather, um, how do you manage communication within a team? <laughs> well, my answer to this was uh, with politeness, respect and a healthy dose of good humour, <laughs> <laughs> as well as uh, a good amount of uh, empathy for the competing priorities that everybody has. I think, you know, I mean, communication can be in many different ways, but I think that working um, in implementation where you're working, you know, between researchers, clinicians and in, in the health space as well, I think it's really important to be aware, particularly at the moment in the last two, three years that we've had, um, uh, you know, with COVID-19, but, you know, honestly, health services have been pressured and busy for years. It's not a new phenomenon. <laughs> um, it's just a more uh, obvious phenomenon now. Um, I think so. I think just really having a good, you know, have, you know, creating a space that, you know, can help, but also just, you know, being respectful of everybody. And, um, you know, uh, as I said, having a, you know, a real, you know, acknowledgement of the different competing priorities. But I think the other thing, I mean, I could talk about different mechanisms that you can use and meetings and all of those things, but I think they're all, we all know those things in different ways and different things will work well with different teams and depending on what you're trying to achieve at the time and how you want to meet people. But the other thing, and I think Steph, Stephanie just kind of touched it, touched on this as well, was, was um, certainly frequently reminding yourself, yourself and, you know, and your team out loud, and the, and the team that you're working with about the fundamental aim of what your work is trying to do. You know, that you're trying to improve patient care for the service, you're trying to improve patient outcomes if that's what you're doing, or you're trying to improve staff experience of delivering care in the most um, effective way. And also, you know, optimizing the degree of evidence-based care, for example. So it could be one of all of these things, but we I certainly found it helpful um, in all of the work that I've done just to, you know, always for myself, reminding myself that this is what we're doing and when you do that and if even if you kind of just make sure that you say something along those lines each meeting you know just when we're getting bogged down and how on earth can this sticky note get put here and how on <laughs> earth why doesn't the wi-fi work within the walls across the walls in this underground bunker that you're in oh, God, <laughs> you didn't think about that did we <laughs> it's like you know and it's like oh why won't that person respond to our emails and you just you know when you get a bit frustrated with some of those things and those logistics just i think trying to remind yourselves around the focus of what you're doing can actually make sure everybody because everybody working in health is generally coming at it with that idea that they want to improve patient outcomes patient care um, staff outcomes service outcomes evidence-based practice so I think it's really important to just get back to that thing it's not so much about that particular document or that particular drug you know it's actually about this whole thing so I think that can be really helpful for how you kind of um, manage communication within a team. And I would always just say, you know, just equally, equal respect to everybody, making sure everybody has a voice. And if you're kind of the coordinator or lead of the team, just making sure that everyone's perspective is gathered um, along the way um, without that, you know, that kind of managing sometimes those challenges. But that would be my answer. People may have different views, but that's the way I took it, yeah. So definitely trying to get a bit of perspective every now and then when you feel like things are a little bit off track. Yeah, I think I, I often think... said in our work, didn't I? I remember my worst day as an ICU nurse when um, three patients died and three of my patients died before midday and I only started at eight. So I always remind myself of that day. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, things are always never quite as bad as they may seem <laughs> on some yeah. days. But... It's a good perspective to have. Um, I, would, yeah. I would also say, um, just on that, um, there's obviously different types of communication that you'll have with your internal team, 
um, you know, who you work with on a daily basis on, you know, various different projects. And I definitely think, um, you know, that, you know, the empathy, the care, the, the humour, um, and all those kind of um, minutia internal communications is really important. Um, but one thing I've found, with, especially with really senior clinicians or senior academics, um, you might have a project that's going to go on for five years and it can often take a long time to kickstart um, before, you know, before um, things are actually happening. Um, and often there can be a, a, a real, you know, large amount of people involved. Um, and when they are so senior, um, the last thing you want to be doing is wasting their time. So I think trying to think of different and creative ways to um, enable people to attend the meetings where you really need them, um, but not have to attend every single meeting, um, you know, that, that's going on, especially in those early phases. Um, and, um, and also, you know, sharing updates, you know, efficiently, um, effectively, you know, kind of, you know, whether it's every two weeks or every month, um, you know, just to, just, just to the broader group. Um, and also making sure that everybody understands they're very welcome to attend the meetings, but this, you know, this is what we're focus is. These are the people that we need. Um, and for the rest of you, you know, you've, you've got a, a free, a free break um, to catch up on all the other important things that you're doing. Um, so I guess that's more of a logistics type um, piece of advice, but something I've um, learned um, over the years and, and found to be really useful. Yeah, I think that's a, such a great tip as well. Yeah, and B, I think you wanted to, to comment on that. Oh, yeah. And I was also just saying, actually, it's also communicating outside of your immediate group as well. So like ensuring you're keeping communicating with the end user and that much broader group of people as well, because otherwise things fall off the radar. So, I mean, we always send out, not that regularly, but, you know, a, a big newsletter that goes to everybody that's actually and often those are the people that are actually doing the doing and like, you know, it's nice for them to see the output and that, you know, you're having impact and just to kind of acknowledge their input as well. So yeah, it's not all around your investigator team. It is that sort of broader team as well, I think, as well. Mm. I, I was, sorry, I was just going to mention something about that sort of logistics, the really boring bit is I mean, I only, I'm involved in so many different projects sort of all around sort of Australia and internationally as well. And they all have a different way of sharing. Some sometimes it's on Teams, sometimes it's Slack, sometimes it's through one email address. If I'm, you know, I'm going for another email address, and then so somebody says to me, "So Steph, Steph, Steph we've got this project, blah, blah, blah. and I've got, I've got all the documents on the uh, Teams folder, and my heart just sort of sinks. And I'm kind of like, so, <laughs> of course, I'm enthusiastic. And, and the problem is, the Teams, they are great ways of sharing." Um, uh, to the uh, documents and things, aren't they? Um, so what I've now done is, um, and, and this is probably because I maybe I'm a lover. I don't think I'm a lover. I'm just maybe IT and it, I don't know. <laughs> I've now got a folder on my desktop where every time I'm invited to a different project and Steph, this is how we're going to be sharing the information. I put it all in my this links folder that I've got on my desktop. So I just need to go to that and I go, right, okay. Um, rapid genomics oh okay we're doing that through this thing you know or you know so another project we're doing oh I just need to click on that and it takes me straight to to that work so um I'm sure there are other people who are far more technically apt than me um but that's my kind of workaround as to how to, you know to work across multiple different projects great tip Steph and um I'm conscious of the time as well knowing that we have 10 minutes to go so Last question, and I think I might throw this to B first. Um, if you can reflect on, you know, the past projects that you've worked on, can you share with us a challenge and a success that you've experienced in the past? There are many, many challenges, I think. <laughs> um, look, I think challenges are often around getting everybody on board and everybody on, on the same page and agreeing what your priorities and, and your agenda are. And I think um, particularly when you're working with a broad multidisciplinary team, I think you do have to acknowledge that everybody has a lot of competing priorities, not just in terms of their time, but also their own agenda slightly as well. So I think it like the cohesion and actually getting everybody on board to actually agree that 
this is this is the way we should actually move a project forward is, is quite a challenge. Um, I mean, I think probably one of the biggest successes we had was where we actually managed to implement a completely new system um, within an end within a broad range of MDTs actually, which involved the MDT but pathology service, you know, like a whole kind of range of things that were brought together. But to be fair, that was actually something that was very bottom up driven. Um, so I think reflecting back on that, that's um, it's probably one of the big, biggest successes we had and had a significant effect on practice. Um, whether it was sustained or not, that's debatable. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that probably is one of the biggest biggest successes and biggest challenges is always around a kind of cohesive team, I think, um, and getting the right people at the table um, to ensure that you can actually kind of, you know, do anything. Because I think sometimes, you know, you see implementation studies and nothing actually ever happens. You can have a five-year trial and really at the end of the five years, nothing has ever really actually being achieved because of just the logistics of the whole project, I think. Um, and on, on, sorry, Pete, on, on the flip side of that, you sometimes see those implementation studies where they just go so smoothly. And we do this, <laughs> and, we do this and then this happened, and everybody was happy. And it's just kind of like, hmm. <laughs> sorry, I need to interrupt. <laughs> um, Steph, did you want to share some of the challenges and successes that you might have faced in the past? I think much as, as B was saying, I think, yeah, there are, there's always lots of challenges. And I think that just reflects that um, iterative nature of working in this field of implementation. And um, <laughs> some, somebody was just saying sort of offhand, oh, well, it's not implement, it's not, no, sorry, it's not rocket science, they were sort of saying to me there. I was kind of going, do you know what? Actually, you're right. It's not, it's far more complex than that. <laughs> rocket science is very, very difficult. And I mean, I can't do rocket science. But it's logical, it's rational. You you know, you do A and you get B, and you might not know what C is going to be, but if you know, whereas we're working with people and a whole range of different stakeholders, and and we aren't all rational beings, and so you know, sort of we we don't all, always do what we expect other people to be doing. So I think that um I think some of those challenges just come with the nature of the territory that, that we're working in. Um and I think really I just reflect what B was just saying about, you know, that need to be getting people on board and to be engaging with them um, and, and everything that everybody's just sort of said sort of previously about that keeping people engaged um, and, and appropriately engaged is, is just so important for these, these long projects that sort of we can be working really, really, really hard, uh, but actually the output that somebody sees at that particular point might be really kind of small. So I think I think that's really um really important to be doing and I think as well actually what I've noticed often is that often your most challenging groups of people if you can get them on board become your strongest advocates mm -hmm. so you shouldn't shy away from that I think you know the most reticent people can actually be really quite powerful mm. Nat what about you um I think um one of the biggest challenges I've found is um it's really like breaking through into the system. So, you know, every hospital that we were trying to, um, you know, establish a contract for an implementation lead, um, you know, to do this piece of applied implementation, as well as run the research um, within those hospitals and all the ethics and governance that comes with that. Um, I think in the earlier days, you know, I didn't quite realise how much red tape um, would be, you know, would be there um, and how much time it would take to, to get through that. And, and I think with that can come quite a bit of worry, especially if you're somebody who is in, you know, a CIA of a grant um, and, and that worry can transcend into your research teams. But I think, um, you know, a, again, kind of just, I guess kind of um, keeping the faith that things will work out and the project will finish um, and you know we're going to come up with you know even if change doesn't happen there's so much that you learn as a team about why things have happened the way that they've happened especially if you are doing um, you know process evaluation type work along the side and all of that is contributing to hopefully advancing science in implementation so I think although as B and, and, and Steph both said, sometimes, you know, the projects don't work out and we see that quite a lot um, within uh, the evidence base, 
there's always something that we can learn and and that's a way in which we can then improve um you know the next time so um there's a whole host of challenges but um there's always a positive you can pull from it somewhere <laughs> yeah yeah having that end goal in mind and like you said the learnings that you gain as you go through the process um and a lucky last heather any challenges or successes you can share with us <laughs> well i mean that much with as the others i mean there's there's highlights and lowlights along the way um and, you know but you know there's successes are i guess things uh you know, being sustained in practice, which is always the challenge, um, doesn't always happen, but maybe that even if you can't sustain it, particularly in one service, you've set up a, maybe a system or a framework or a, a way of services working together in a different way. Um, certainly, you know, certainly um, aspects of ADAPT, certainly I know that um, moved on or allowed and um, different members of the services to get to know each other differently and look at the way they could, you know, solve solutions or, you know, solve solutions doesn't even make sense, um, come up with solutions to uh, work together more effectively. I mean, I think that, um, what was I going to say? I've completely lost what I was going to say. Um, uh, Oh, I think it was in relation to what Stephanie said, you know, like, you know, implementation science, you know, isn't rocket science. I like to think of it as responsive science. That's my, that's my <laughs> retort uh, for rocket science. You know, it's not that it's, it's complex, but not in the sim similar kind of way. And one of the skills is that responsiveness to it. And so, I mean, I think that, you know, one, one of the challenges certainly is, you know, trying to do implementation science in an ever-changing, uh, ever-changing space with shifting SAMs, shifting priorities, you know, you know, along the way, you know, and all the things we've done, you know, pandemics have hit, and hit, you know, kind of thing. Services have suddenly decided to do their redevelopment and shift departments to whole new buildings. You know, these things happen. And I think that's one of the challenges of implementation science and implementation programs is, you know, being, uh, you know, able to navigate those things, but embrace that, uh, that responsiveness, that challenge, because you'll get a lot of learnings along the way of how we do this better. So I think that's kind of what I would say around the big challenges you can never quite know what's going to happen <laughs> from the start to the finish but uh being responsive to all of those things is all part of the process so yeah i don't know that's <laughs> the challenge and maybe one of the biggest successes is that we're all here talking about it yes so. Yeah. <laughs> perfect and that's such a perfect way to to end our our conversation today um i really want to thank all of our panelists for joining us this morning, from sharing their insights, providing us with their own expertise on uh, you know, the projects that they have uh, ongoing and yeah, a great way to end on their challenges uh, and successes. I also wanna thank the uh, in Inspire team from Mona and, and Liz. Thanks so much for helping to facilitate uh, the webinar. And of course, of course, the POCOG team, Bonnie and uh, Joe for helping to coordinate and facilitate this. So with that, I let you all have two minutes back in your calendar to go get a cup of tea <laughs> or run to the loo before your next meeting. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, so Thanks everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.